Tomorrow is a Ball, Can I Bounce It on the Driveway is one of the dumbest titles in history and the name of my fifth album, which I have a lot of mixed thoughts on. And, and I know I feel like I've said that about most of my other albums, but this one especially. Like, it's the most conflicted I feel about any of my albums. Granted, I feel like my perspective is pretty skewed on this one. For one thing, it was the first album I promoted online and got people to actually notice. For a lot of people, this album was the jumping on point for my music because I used a bunch of tracks from this album in my YTPs. And perhaps as a result, it's the one I've most commonly seen praise for. But on the other hand, it's also kind of weird for me because If Tomorrow Was a Ball was the first album I ever made directly for the Bandcamp page. I usually associate my albums with a full year in my life. But not this one. It was released in the same year as Inside the Mainframe, and since my work on that one took up a bigger chunk of 2013, I tend to associate the year a little more with that album. But I went about making this album really differently from usual. I wanted to work on the same set of tracks and put more of my focus on getting each individual one to be the best they could possibly be. I think the final result is an album that features a couple of the best songs I've ever made, but as a complete whole is a scattered mess. Like, you see the badly executed dad joke that is the album title standing out like a sore thumb in my catalog, and the Hatsune Miku cover I got from a wallpaper site, chosen because of that cool train recording studio setup, and not because I had any clue who Miku even was at the time. I didn't. <laughs> Doesn't exactly look to me like the kind of album that screams, this is thinking man's music. But in spite of its obvious lack of seriousness, it's also not an album I feel is typically suited to listening all in one go. I almost never actually do anymore. There may be great moments on it, but it's hard to listen to the whole thing without thinking about the things I wish I'd done differently. The lowest points on here are, am are among the lowest points on any album of mine, and yeah, I, I, can't, I just can't call it great by any stretch. But there is still something here. I don't regard this album as complete trash, and there are moments on this thing I don't know if I'll ever be able to replicate. There, there is definitely a vibe to this album that sets it apart from all my other ones, and apart from any others I've heard. There's a pretty clear appeal to this album that you can't really get elsewhere. It's just, you know, I consider it pretty heavily flawed. So, uh, may as well start with what about this album doesn't work for me now. Uh, first and foremost, I do not think this album flows well at all. <laughs> all my albums have continuous mixes, though it took a while for me to figure out how to properly put them together. The one I did for Inside the Mainframe earlier that year worked pretty well, I thought at least, but it was still not a much mixing actual tracks. Most of the tracks are spaced out with field recordings. But still, that album feels a lot more cohesive. If Tomorrow Is A Ball has a continuous mix, but an incredibly basic one that doesn't go much further than basically doing default iTunes-style crossfading. The most egregious example that comes to mind is the transition between DNA and the Disappearing Table and The Night Drives Me Crazy But It Still Looks Great. <laughs> I go back and forth on whether making the song titles as ridiculous as possible is a great idea or a really stupid one, but you didn't... I'm... Um, whatever. This is just going to be a lot of mouthfuls. But yeah, the transition between these two tracks is almost non-existent. The key doesn't match, the beat doesn't lead up to it, or sync up beat-wise in any way. The tempo really doesn't match. The only thing mixing the two is a bit of the fade out of the former bleeding over into the latter, and I'm not sure it would have just been better to leave them unmixed entirely. The album's got a lot of mediocre or even outright flubbed transitions like this. Hell, I, I think really only two or three transitions on this album stuck the landing at all. But I didn't really have much experience putting together continuous mixes at the time. Like, I guess I was using 808 States Down Solaris as a point of reference, because that that album also just barely lets the the a couple of seconds of fade bleed into the next track. But you know, it was a good like a point to improve my skills upon in that department. Like I'd cause then I'd go on to make the continuous mixes for all my remaining albums, which are all better executed to me now. This really isn't an album that was significantly improved by having a continuous mix in the first place, honestly, but it has one because I thought just by having one it would make all of these disparate tracks sound more like they belong together. That did not really work. 
Well, I guess they can fit together in the same way that the various tracks on something like Square Pusher's Just a Souvenir does, in that it juggles a whole bunch of different styles and doesn't let any one style get too much focus over another, creating its own vibe in and of itself just through the juxtaposition. But Just a Souvenir doesn't have a continuous mix, nor does it need one. And this one probably didn't either, but whatever. I guess the mix on this one is for something for me to be able to say that all my albums technically have continuous mixes. As for individual tracks, there are two here that I just outright don't like at all. I don't like Can't Just Do This Without You. There's nothing there that isn't done better on other tracks here, especially Everything Takes Longer Than It Takes, and the guy doing a James Brown impression in the back half of the track is really corny and out of place. To this day, this track remains the only individual track of mine someone has bought on iTunes, which kind of bewilders me, but whatever. <laughs> Bandcamp is better anyways. The other track I don't like on here is Mies van der Rohe has a square in his butt, which does not remotely deliver on the amazingness that the title promises. It's just a really simplistic and atonal ambient piece that doesn't really go anywhere or deliver anything interesting. It's, it's just album filler. It was the last track I made for the album because I thought it needed another ambient piece in there for the sake of pacing, and while I'll admit the, the inclusion of this track does in fact allow the following two tracks to land with more impact, I threw it together in like 20 minutes, and it's just thoroughly unimpressive to me. I suppose I'm also not huge on the intro, October Radio, which just combines a whole bunch of random reversed audio snippets that I had lying around in the My Music folder on my computer. Not a very indicative tone setter for this thing. Though I will admit that is an intro that leaves an impression. And Dark Clouds Over Blue Street is an okay soundtrack-ish piece that doesn't bug me, but it doesn't add anything or really leave any, any impression at all. It's just there. There are also two tracks here that bug me because they had the potential to be better, but I went overboard and tried to add too much to it. First, there's Metallic Glass and Dark Sky, which my first draft of just stopped halfway, although it was perfectly fine the way it was. Not too many elements, just the, the drumming and the, the ambient pads, but they all do their job well. Though for the final album version, I added that whole sidetrack with the Electric Roads pianos. And while the, those sound fine by themselves, they don't really mesh well with the ambient pads. I mean, it could have turned out a lot worse, but, you know, it could have been better. And Suitcases and Spears on the Stairs also used to be half as long in my first draft, laid out in the exact same way, in that it just piles musical elements on top of each other and goes more and more off the chain as it goes on. The original was less than four minutes, and piled on each element a lot faster, and it was so much more addicting a listen that way. Like, just how fast it goes completely out of control, it was glorious. But I loved that first draft so much, I convinced myself it needed to be longer. So I let everything develop at half the pace so I could savor everything more. But the final result was a track that landed with, like, half the impact. It wasn't quite as striking when stretched out like that. I turned one of my favorite tracks there into, like, a, a mid-tier track. A, a fine, a good track, but not a great one. I suppose the purpose of that track sort of ended up getting supplanted by The Night Drives Me Crazy But It Still Looks Great, a track that I kinda gotta enjoy for how absolutely ridiculous it is. No human would be able to play that guitar or those drums that fast. At least that I know of. And those orchestral strings thrown in there for good measure make it pretty dang epic. But I guess while I'm on that topic, let's talk about the other tracks on here that I think really did work. If I had been releasing singles from this album, I know right off the bat three of them that would have worked as standalone singles. Of course, there's the opener, All Highways Run in Reverse. That was the first track I made for this album, and as soon as I was done with it, I was like, nail it. I think Everything Takes Longer Than It Takes would be a single, too. Gotta love the laid-back 70s disco grooves of that one. The strings and the horns and everything in it sounds so nice. Always love me some 70s sounding stuff. Heck, this track also uh, kind of got retooled into a little track I made specifically for one of my YTPs in 2014 called the Vindaloo Fetish Song. <laughs> I imagine that's uh, the kind of title that will come off pretty creepy if you don't know the context behind it, but it became one of my most popular tracks specifically thanks to that context. So that's cool. Well, felt like I had to mention that. As a side note, I don't actually hold the Vindaloo Fetish Song in quite as high regard as the original Everything Takes Longer Than It Takes. 
Then Dilda Fetish got thrown together in like 10 minutes by editing a demo song that came with a pack of 70s funk slash disco loops that I used so frequently on this album. And the original Everything Takes Longer felt like it had more thought put into it and more dimensionality. I definitely put more love into the original, but... You know, I guess Vindaloo Fetish has a more, uh, like, a rollicking and peppy energy to it that no other track I've made really matches. But I digress. The other track on here that I think is material for a standalone single is You Are Uncorrupted, Stay Vigilant. The bass line on that one is amazing, and the track has one is one of the most addicting I think I've ever made. And there is one interlude on here mentioned above, DNA on the Disappearing Table. By far the best of the ambient interludes on this album. Also carried by one really good bass line and thanks to its use in one of my YTPs could theoretically be single material as well, even though I didn't exactly put that much thought into it at the time. That leaves the last two tracks, which are a bit too long and over the top for me to think that they'd work well as standalone singles, but are both two of the biggest highlights on this thing. Standby on track 39 is a ridiculously overstuffed homage to Dead Mouse. Somewhat stylistically resembles something he'd do, albeit far more over the top than most of his stuff. But the build-ups are great, with all the dense layers upon layers of synth notes just creating absolute chaos. And the drop is one of the hardest-hitting and headbang-worthy moments on any of my albums ever. It's so crazy that my simple copy-pasting of that whole progression, while lazy, feels, you know, warranted. But that's nothing compared to the escalation and the closer on this thing. Well, it doesn't bang quite as much, this is probably the most climactic ending to any of my albums, bringing together all the various sounds and styles and certainly living up to its title. Fun fact, that last section where it just goes completely off the rails and almost into orchestral drum and bass territory, that wasn't even in my first draft of the track. Though, I, I heard that first version that was like, that stopped at like the 7 minute mark or something. And I thought, this is all build up with no payoff, gotta add some payoff in there. And yeah, I, I think I delivered there. It is a completely nuts ending that I think fits how completely nuts the full album is. So, yeah. So those are my thoughts on If Tomorrow Is A Ball, Can I Bounce It On The Driveway. I will admit my personal enjoyment of this whole thing will likely ne never go beyond I thinking it's good, like in the middle 07 range. I tend to think it can be a, like a total overambitious mess and a major mixed bag, not to mention its reliance on a pretty unique sounding set of loop libraries I purchased around that time, make it the kind of thing that I'm never going to be able to f really replicate as much as I may try. But the fact that I find some of it worth trying to replicate says something in and of itself. As much mispotential as I think this album had, I do have to admit, it's it's got something to it. And I'm glad it resonated with some people more strongly than it resonates with me now. Mm -hmm.